Hey, it's Elise Pickett here with the Urban Harvest, and today we are here with Amy and John from Frog Song Organics, and we are going to be taking a tour of their organic commercial farm uh, that they have just outside of Gainesville in Hawthorne, Florida. So how does your chickens factor into the overall scheme of things in your farm? Um, well, so we really like to have the chickens um, drop their fertility in place. So while we do purchase in some chicken manure and um, composted cow manure, the chickens actually create a lot of fertility right where they're grazing. So instead of collecting their manure and having to spread it, we actually move the paddock where the chickens are located. So they get moved about once a week onto fresh pasture. And if you look, if you pan that way, you can see that's where they were, um, you know, last week. And you can see they pretty much ate everything. And then now they're on this nice, um, well, it's like pretty okay pasture. We planted some ryegrass. So they're gonna eat the ryegrass. We supplement them with a the soy-free organic feed, and then we'll move them again in another Next week. week yeah. mm -hmm. And so the, the concentration definitely is under the coop where they sleep at night, but they definitely poop everywhere. And so if we just keep moving them around, keep moving them around, eventually the whole field gets nice and fertilized. And um, it's a nice quick release kind of uh, nitrogen for the plants. And then we have to follow, um, we have to follow some rotation guidelines because it's considered an application of raw manure. So you have to wait a little while before you can harvest things. But you know, we always plant, we plant a lot of times cover crops afterwards or crops that, you know, take longer to grow. Like you wouldn't come in and plant radishes right after. Yeah, 21 um, days later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, some crops would take a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, the chickens, they, they generate a lot of fertility and, uh, and then they also eat a lot of pest larvae and eggs nice. and they also eat a lot of weeds. John, I mean, any, they definitely weed a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any, any other benefits of the chickens to the um, farm that you can think of? Weeds, fertility, pests, and protein. And protein, <laughs> yeah. And then the other yeah. thing too is um, I know that normally, you know, most of your um, audience is doing more like homesteading scale, but even on a homesteading scale or any scale, really um, having that protein production and having a diversification of your products is really important because if you have extra eggs, you can sell them, you can trade them, you know, and they're also something that like when we go to the farmer's market, it's one more item that a customer can come to our booth and buy. So it helps people coming uh, back to us week after week. And our eggs, we're pretty well known for the quality of the eggs because the chickens are eating so much fresh grass and the feed quality is really good. So um, we, sell out every week so how many eggs do you get a week on average um right now we're averaging about 12 dozen a day okay so, so oh my gosh math <laughs> <laughs> and it'll just go up from the springtime so you have how many different flocks that you're rotating through your farm um right now we have three flocks so we have two flocks that are laying and then we have one flock that will come into lay uh, probably next by next, so. well, actually this month it should be, they should be coming into lay really soon. So they take about five to six months to start laying. Mm -hmm. And then we keep them for about another two years after that. And then we harvest them for stewing half. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's sandy, it's dark. This one's really wet in this field. That's one of the reasons that we had just the chickens grazing, but you can see all the dark matter in there. It's a cover crop material that's broken down. It's a chicken poop, I'm sure here, <laughs> last uh, month or so. And um, as soon as we get some air into this soil, then uh, we'll make some beds up and we'll probably plant here. I was thinking probably sweet corn in this block right here. Um, mm -hmm. So it follows the chickens. Um, basically right now it's just kind of working in what the chickens dropped and like all the rest of the residue of like the grass and stuff. And in another week or so it's ready to plant. So um, we'll, we'll uh, pull like a modified rake through here and it'll get air into the soil if we need to get into the ground sooner. Right now it's not high priority. This one is basically looking to be planted in like two weeks or so, uh, like actually seeded one week for the beds. Uh, basically you can uh, plant it here um, when the when the soil's loose enough to drag the cedar through. That's one of the hardest things is in our soil is a lot of times it's too wet to actually seed it. 
so we'll have to go in there and do something other than uh, planting corn. We could like transplant lettuce or something like that. But in this situation with the uh, manure, we couldn't. So sweet corn is pretty much what we have to plant here. <laughs> that's, that's because like, they were just rotating through. Yeah, exactly. Sweet corn goes by like a 90 day rule versus a 120 day rule for the rest of the. Oh, because uh, it doesn't touch the ground. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If the sweet corn gets dirt on it, so then it's eating, out of spec. Right? Yeah, okay. exactly. That's why I say if the sweet corn's got dirt on it, then we have to like discard it. It's not going to be sold essentially. Mm -hmm. We yeah. might eat it ourselves. But, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I would. <laughs> but we would not be we would not be like selling the, the dirty uh, one that falls down and yeah. actually has the husk open and everything, you know, that would be quite bad luck. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So you guys use so you're not tilling necessarily, you're raking to loosen the soil. Well we do in till. Order to, okay. Yeah, so there is no such thing as a successful no till vegetable farm I've seen in Florida yet. Like mm -hmm. that was like on a large, on a scale that was paying paychecks. Like uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, I just haven't seen it yet. So like um, the tropical grass and everything that we have here, the, um, all sorts of weeds and you know stuff that basically propagates the more that you hit it, you know, the more if like you chop it up with a shovel or a, you know, it, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, it, it, you, thanks for propagating me. Now I'm like 10 times as powerful. So we have to till for a certain period of time. And then to, in our soil, because of how heavy it is, we have to make it taller beds so that the air actually gets into the soil. And if we have good tall beds, then it'll have the right amount of moisture and air. And then we can cover those beds with mulch. So that's what we'll do for like the longer term summer summertime crops. If it's like a highly erodible area, or if it's a, thank you, Jade. <laughs> if it's um, if it's a crop that's um, you know um, needs to stay clean or something, you know, or it needs to stay out of the soil, then we can have the uh, the, the the hay on it during the heavy rain. You know? Yeah, and so you don't have to splash. Exactly, no splash, no erosion, you know, and it keeps the soil cool. Um, mm -hmm. So like our eggplant and our peppers, we'll do on like raised beds with hay on them for the summertime. And it works pretty well in this situation. It's worth spreading the hay. It's a huge expense to spread hay, yeah. you know, but it's definitely worth it. Um, the strawberries that you'll see, you know, they're all on hay and so no plastic at all in the field. So when you go to destroy it at the end of the year, it's just till it in and that's, that's, so it is tilling, you know, it's like, um, as much as I would love to find an, an organic no-till that worked here, yeah. it's, you, it's a whole different, um, biology than like where that school of thought is coming from, mm -hmm. you know, like the roller crimper idea. Mm -hmm. It's like, th yeah, that, that's the worst idea to do to a lot of our uh, weeds, you know, or Bermuda grass or something like that. If you had Bermuda grass and you went and roll and crimp it, you've just made yourself a beautiful Bermuda lawn, you, you know? Can, yeah. You yeah. Can turn into a sod retailer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you have most pieces of, of soil in Florida already have like Ber Bermuda, Bahia, some noxious grass that like would be imported or invasive, you know, of some sort. So tropical or crabgrass too, you know, like mm -hmm. you just can't beat it with like uh, a roll of crimper. So then you go into the realm of herbicides and that just goes way away from where we are looking, you know, like yeah. why would we want to put an herbicide down? I'd rather till the ground, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've done this for 300,000 years. Yeah. So like of some sort, we've tilled the ground up, you know, and um, obviously now with like giant areas of tilled the ground, you see the huge, you know, problem with that. Yeah, but, yeah. But Definitely the, the approach the time, more so than anything exactly. is, you know, using the proper approach. We're oftentimes replacing what would have naturally happened in the system anyhow. Like, you know, our grazers and everything else, they were tilling the land for us. They're not there anymore. So we're just doing the job as long as it's done right. That's how you do the, with the pigs, too. So you'll see that. Say, yeah. yeah. Let's go, let's awesome. let's go check pigs. out the pigs. <laughs> so, how do the pigs, um, how do the pigs integrate into your farm and what, is, what function do they play? Yeah, so one of the biggest reasons that we actually started working with pigs is because of the large sweet potato crop that we grow in the fall. And when you harvest the sweet potatoes, we have a disc, we flip them with the tractor and we're hand harvesting the potatoes. So we're still picking them up. And then there's always ones that are, you know, damaged or you miss them or they're too small. You know, there's potatoes that you don't get when you harvest them. So the pigs actually help us clean up the field after harvesting because the sweet potato vine, if you don't get it out of the field, it actually becomes a weed in the next crop. So um, when we're harvesting the sweet potatoes, we turn the pigs out onto the fields after we've harvested and they love to eat the vines and they love to eat the sweet potatoes. So they eat up all that crop, they leave their fertility, they till up the soil, and then we come back in and plant. So this is, the pigs were here, the ground that we're standing on right now, pigs were here a few weeks ago. Um, and you know, this will be sweet corn. Uh, yeah, this will yeah. Yeah, get turned into more cropland. And then you can see, this is one week of pigs. Um, it looked like that. Yeah. Well, it wasn't quite no, as this much is just seed a few head. Days ago. Um, they were moved on like Tuesday, I think. 
So yeah, less than a week. So the pigs, I mean, they really do a number on the soil very quickly, and you, especially with the larger animals, um, you know, they, they till it up really, really fast. So yeah, they basically, they, you know, clean up all the crop residue and um, they're really fun to watch. And it's another protein source, another diversification of the farm. So it's just another way that we can use a lot of our waste stream to produce food. So all of the scraps from our packing shed, all the lettuce leaves we trim, you know, everything we grade out um, goes back to the pigs. So they actually get a lot of organic vegetables, plus they get their um, ration of an organic soy-free feed. So this is a native crop here, and we propagated all of our own stock up until this year. And uh, we do have some new um, genes coming in. A uh, gentleman's gonna donate a few different varieties to the farm this year. It's not quite open yet. In about a week from now, you'll be able to smell that nice uh, elderberry smell. These guys are, see the flower buds? They're just about ready to pop, but you don't see any petals yet. The petals are what we're looking for. We'll find one that's open. But what these do is they uh, attract beneficial insects. So they attract uh, ladybugs and lace wings and all sorts of uh, beneficial flies and wasps. And it provides them a nectary out in the middle of the field here. So we try to space these all around. And the most randomized way we've done it is wherever we lose a fruit tree, we plant an elderberry. <laughs> so if uh, right here, this is a citrus row, and this citrus tree died like three years ago, so we replanted it with an elderberry, and lo and behold, we got a crop that'll have some marketable yield off of it. It's like half pound, maybe a pound to plant a year, you know. So it's uh, it's it's not a big uh, not a big yield yet, but um, it's an important plant, you know. So beneficial, and. Uh, and beneficial for the health too, you know. Yeah, and one of the best things that we found to do with the elderberries, um, we don't really sell that many of them fresh, but we make a lot of elderberry syrup. So mm -hmm. we harvest them when they're in season and then make some of it fresh. We freeze the berries and then make batches of elderberry syrup. I have some. Year. It's delicious. Oh, thank Thanks. you. Yes. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it, you know, especially um, around cold and flu season. And then of course mm -hmm. in 2020, everybody was like, 24 7. I need that. I need the immune support. So, um, it's yeah. It's been an important crop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we, we make it from, oh, thank Thanks, you. Um, we make it with these berries the and then, yeah, ginger, clove, cinnamon. Um, but it's definitely been a great, a great way to add some value to a crop. I that a big root otherwise, you know, fresh elderberries. Are, you can only sell so many of them. Yeah. Right, and then they're, they're really labor intensive because once the trees get taller, I mean, you know, you're up you have to get up to pick them and you have to cut the little clusters with your scissors. I mean, they're very... Yeah, we got a technique with our hands Yeah, these but days, I mean, but they're not, they're not super, they're not super quick to harvest. Mm -hmm. But this would so. be the definition of a multi-use crop, just like your chickens are providing more than one function for you. Absolutely. So your elderberry. So the elderberries. Oh, yeah. And it actually provides shade for the chickens once it gets to a certain stage too. So yeah. <laughs> even feeds into that whole livestock thing too and, and when they're out in the middle of the field. Yeah, and then you mentioned that these are all like wild crafted. We've just propagated native stock from yeah what's what's showing up here on the farm we yeah. had some really good uh, mother plants and then over the years as they get to be bigger and bigger they send up uh, like sprouts on the side and we're able to uh, propagate those sprouts during a certain time of year so it works really well and uh, this year we're going to start trying to grow some of the uh, northern varieties and uh, there may even be a, a european variety that we'll try to put into the farm and see how those do or maybe they cross with the native ones too and make something cool I see some. Did you find some eggs? Oh, there they are. Nice yeah. eye. Good job, Dave. Mom, there you go. You can That's what the eggs look like. Up. So these guys Mom. make those right there. Dad. And so right now we're in are this stage. Dad? Yes, they'll eat all the leaves if you give them a chance to. And we've had we've bad. we've seen it happen before. So this is oh yeah, you have some there. You see right there? Yeah. yeah. So you guys the eggs on. Um what do you use to um, go through dealing with pests? How do you deal with pests on your organic farm at a commercial scale? What you got to do is you have to look at how much is it going to cost you to eliminate this pest. You know, like if you were going to try to get it to like, you know, almost complete control versus like what's the actual tolerable level for like, you know, how, how many leaves out here can they eat and we still get a good potato crop. I know? think they call and it like so an economic threshold. Economic threshold. Yeah, so yep. just w at what point is it worth it to control? Yeah. Or, if or at, what, to at what level do you have to try to uh, gain, you know, what, what are you, what's your goal of control? You know, like when you go out there and pray, are you trying to kill 99.9% .9 of everything or are you going to be happy with, uh, you know, 70 or 80% and then, you know, basically another 
uh, mode of action for your next spray that takes care of another 80%, you know? And so uh, what you have to do on the potatoes especially is um, if you let these guys get a really strong population, then they'll take down your foliage before you get to set a good crop. So you kind of have to you have to get a good handle on them early in the crop. And um, what we'll do now that we don't have any um, any uh, rain coming is we spray diatomaceous earth out here. So um, putting the diatomaceous earth in helps a lot um, with the uh, mode of action basically. So when these little eggs, where'd the, that one go? When these little guys hop, um, start hatching out, then they'll hop, they'll basically crawl through the diatomaceous earth and it'll kill the larva before they even get to eat the leaves. So if you have a good layer of diatomaceous earth on there, it works um, kind of as a preventative as the uh, larvae start to hatch out. But you still got to do something about the adults. See? And you really can't even uh, kill all the adults. Yeah, there you go. Bye-bye. There you go. <laughs> These guys just need to get stomped on. So. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that, you know, that we try to think about too is, you know, like he was saying before, you, you want to get the control before it sets a crop. If we're about to harvest and we see a bunch of beetles out there and we're gonna, we know we're digging the potatoes the next day, we're not going to worry about exactly. if there's a pest out Later there. on in the season when the potatoes are eating the leaves and you've already got good form potatoes up there, we don't even spray anymore because it's not even worth it. Like there's so many adults out there and so much of the life cycle is going on that you can't even take them down. Like the adults don't really die from any of the things that we can spray organic. So the neem oil or the uh, pyrethrums, those are the two main things that we can do at this stage. Um, they will just kind of uh, upset the adults and they'll keep moving around, you know, and they won't necessarily go to your leaves as much. Um, but they still keep coming like they you can't really kill them and we can do in trust which is a spinosad and i just haven't seen it kill the adult beetles like uh, other other farmers have said uh, spinosad does so maybe in our fields they've had a little too much of the exposure to spinosad in the last like eight years it's you know we don't want to eat it when it goes out but i think i feel pretty safe a few days afterwards um, after it's out here and especially how much we wash the produce too when it goes out <clears throat> versus like anything that's inside the plant none of our um, sprays or anything that we can use goes uh, translaminar or in, inside the leaves or inside the phloem xylem of the plant whereas a lot of you know modern pesticides are systemic or, or partly systemic and so they're inside the actual vegetable when you're eating or like the potato you know a lot of systemic pesticides that they'd use in like traditional potato or like I say conventional potatoes they're left in there in the potato chips and all the other things that you're eating from them so it's really gnarly so that's why you know when we're talking about organic pesticides it might be necessary in a crop like this but we're always going to try to reduce the use of them because they're so darn expensive you know if, if anything you have to look at the cost and then you know what is the real um I say gain of using it or not you know? yeah and it's not just the materials but also the tractor time so tell me a little bit about the farm, how you guys got started and your overall um, approach or mission with uh, growing all this food. John and I both went to the University of Florida and John studied horticulture, yeah, horticulture and I studied science. plant science and agronomy. And we really wanted to start our own farm, but uh, we didn't really have a lot of the tools that we needed from our university education to get into business so it was really a lot of kind of trial by fire trial by error mm -hmm. and um like a big laboratory yeah <laughs> so um after we graduated you know we worked we moved out to california we saved up some money we came back here to look for property and our goal was really to produce a lot of really healthy food and create some meaningful employment opportunities and we have definitely <clears throat> achieved that mission. Um, we're still working on it and always trying to improve a little bit, uh, you know, what we're doing every single day. Um, but yeah, we really started with, you know, just wanting to have really great food to eat ourselves and to be able to share that with the community. And John is super, super motivated to make our food available to as many people as far and wide as possible so we non-exclusive yeah um, <laughs> we are non-exclusive yeah we, so we've definitely grown a lot we started with about six acres in 2011 so 2021 this will actually be 10 years on the farm and in that 10 years or almost 10 years we've expanded to over 60 acres and we grow over 80 different kinds of crops we had a couple babies um, <laughs> And few dozen we, pigs, few yeah, hundred few dozen chickens, pigs. and here we are later, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and now, you know, we've actually expanded our reach beyond Alachua County, and we actually bring food all the way down to Pinellas County, where mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of markets in the Orlando area, so we go to the Winter Park Market, we go all the way out to St. Augustine. So, Jacksonville. Um, 
yeah, Jacksonville yeah. area. Yeah. So we've really tried to expand our reach. And um, one of the really amazing things about Alachua County and one of the reasons we came here was because there was such a great little community of small farmers. But we also realized pretty quickly that in order to um, distribute all the food that we were producing, once we started growing, we needed to go outside of our county because there already are a lot of great small farmers meeting the needs of people in our community. And of course, there's always more people that could eat more vegetables too right here. But um, we just found like it was really helpful for us to expand our reach a little bit. So we're willing to drive and yeah. we do quite a bit of that right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have good customers throughout the state, you know, so we got to keep them healthy. And that's, yes, that's what absolutely. it's all about. So how do you guys, what is your definition of healthy food? You guys grow here, organic certification can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. Um, so what what is different about your farm? Do you consider yourself to be uh, regenerative agriculture or Definitely. what what components make um, your approach different? I think we were um, trying to invent the regenerative system here before we even had a word for it, you know? It yeah. was, um, uh, kind of what people call beyond organic or so but we we handle organic certification it's no problem we're already that's that's like half the way there so the other half is what you really have to do to make it um, more of a regenerative system where you know what you're putting in is going to help you in this year next year the year after that and it kind of self-perpetuates and it always has a lot of hard work in it you have to do one way or another but if it gets better every year from what you're doing then you're doing something right you know one of the things that i found was really beautiful i I purchased some of my, my produce that I don't grow myself <laughs> from you all, and it's delicious. Thank I'm you. so glad Thank you guys you. deliver down there. Um, but you guys have also incorporated, especially recently, I've noticed that you guys have started bringing in other small farms mm -hmm. to try to, help, I think maybe you would speak to it better, but, um, you know, helping to support them with the network that you guys have created that is such a widespread network to be able to cover something from Jacksonville to Orlando to St. Pete. Um, but it's something that helps you guys thrive and them thrive. So. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, John really was um, kind of pushing for this when we first started the system. So it all really started with us using a uh, food hub software and being able to track, you know, all the different producers and keep everything identified as to where all it came to from. the very final transaction. Because, get, yeah, yeah, that's super important to us that when you get your delivery, mm -hmm. you know, oh, this um, tomato came from Big Daddy Farm and this, you know, kale came from Little Pond Farm. And um, so what's crazy is in 2020, we actually spent more on products from other farms than we sold in our entire first year of farming. So yeah, when you think about farming, you think like... how many other small farms that's supporting, mm -hmm. we're really talking about regional food security, community food security, because we can't do it all by ourselves. And we don't have a growing region where we can produce all that stuff ourselves, you know, all year round either. So like right now, we just had some yellow squash. It's too early for us to have yellow squash. Or is it like this tall, you know? Yeah. yeah we have um, yellow we squash from Oveto. Yeah, from, from Oveto. Or yeah. Um, when you know what are some other good ones we've, we've gotten some celery from over the there celery is amazing coming from actually all three of our partners in the in the winter yeah. time from and then Warden in the summertime and... you know we sourced some hydroponic um, or aquaponic sorry aquaponic lettuce um so you know we've been able to help people continue to eat healthy and continue to support other farms and we also just reached a point where our own production at this farm we just reached a point where we only have so much land and we do a lot of crop rotation so to have space to rotate everything properly and to have enough people to do mm -hmm. all the work. That's How we're kind of having a new birth of consciousness after the COVID thing about where our food comes from. And we've had really solid customers for 10 years, but we've also gained a lot of good customers in the last year or two, or even seen more frequency of existing customers, you know, eating more of our crops um, in our partner growers crops. And I think that's the optimistic way to look at it right now is that we got more people involved in the local food system. And we can deliver right to your door. You know, that's the that's the power of like the distribution thing that we've put together. Uh, we utilize all the awesome produce around here. You know, so it's not just from one farm that could have bad luck with weather or whatnot. You know, that's what we found when we were starting the distributor model is that we couldn't sustain it off of one farm because you're gonna want romaine every week that there's romaine in Florida. And what know? happens when you or get what, a bad freeze? Yeah, we have a bad freeze yeah. or, you know, or, you know, just a, a irrigation accident or whatever, you know, there's a million mm -hmm. things that can happen on a small farm, but we want our customer, customers to always have like a good experience when they're buying online or shopping at the farmer's market or CSA customers, number one. And uh, I think with this aggregator model that we're making is, 
it's just going to be more successful in the long run. Like whatever happens here, that aggregator will keep on going. I hope, you know, we, we might only grow pears in the future, but you know, yeah. you're going to have an awesome, you know, frog song experience, you know, <laughs> like uh, yeah. from all the partners and everything else. Um, hopefully we'll be really successful with lots of crops here, but you know, it's kind of our insurance policy and also offering really good um, service to our customers at the same time. Yeah. So the regional food security, you spoke to that a couple of times and I think that's an amazing point to make. Um, and you kind of referenced it a little bit, um, you know, the industrial system and how things can cross borders or even not even borders, but coming from mm -hmm. California to Florida mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, so having that regional food security really gives people uh, the opportunity not only to actually access the food, but to have the nutrients that those foods are meant to have Exactly. and having fresh produce accessible to the area, I, I mean, I, I think, isn't it like within 24, 48 hours, you guys are picking and delivering or something? We're trying all the it sensitive just, crops, yeah. 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 Stuff that's coming from here, you know, of course, we're picking it the closest to, you know, things that we pick up from other farms. We, we try to cut it as quickly as we can, and mm -hmm. we try to maintain the cold chain. That's the most important thing is mm -hmm. keeping things mm -hmm. cold. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really was highlighted for us, you know, with last year with 2020 was, um, you know, there were markets that were shut down, but our customers, they still needed food. And we were able to, as an independently run business, be really nimble, you know, adapt, pivot, whatever you want to call it really, really quickly. And we found private property to operate a market on to get food to people. We figured out, okay, we got to blow up home delivery because mm -hmm. we weren't doing a lot of it before. We, we were had, doing like six boxes in a day and yeah, now we we're few, doing like 60 or more, you know? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, had, yeah, that's how, that's how it's gone with home delivery, yeah, you know? We had like a little trickle, easily. but we yeah. had the groundwork, we had the groundwork mm -hmm. laid so that when it was necessary, you know, we did not have any interruptions in service, really. We just kept going and we kept feeding people because we already had the crops in the ground. And, and we so, had to figure out how to sell them too. That was yeah, the thing. That was, was a big challenge, right? When COVID but, happened, yeah. But what people, you know, figured out pretty quick was like, oh, by relying on this direct connection to the food source, it was a lot more reliable than going to the grocery store and not knowing like, oh, I wonder what they're going to have there today. So how can uh, people get in touch with you? Um, it, so you guys sell at the markets and everything like that. And I'm going to have a link down below um, to the website so that they can find out more information. But um, is there a way to support what you guys do if you aren't delivering to their area? Yeah, um, take a day trip and come up during our strawberry you pick season and come pick strawberries, um, come visit the farm when we're open, you know, during those hours. Um, you can also, you know, write us an email and get in touch and let us know if you want to see us in your area. Um, we're always looking for ways to reach new communities. Um, if you're interested in hosting a CSA pickup site, we would love to find new locations to deliver to a group of people because it makes the most sense both um, financially and environmentally. It uses less fuel for us to go to one location and take, you know, many members boxes. So that's something that we like to try to do whenever we can. Um, and then we have a lot of information on our website and you so know, follow definitely us visit on, our website. Yeah. yeah, a lot of information on our website, lots of recipes on our blog. We have a Facebook and Instagram. Um, you and even have some ways that you can donate to our nonprofit of uh, oh, tra yeah. training farmers. So we have uh, Free Mulch, which is a nonprofit that we have on site. That is, uh, its goal is to train more farmers. So one of our big challenges here is that we don't have enough young farmers coming up, and uh, we give uh, basically access to land and uh, access to market here on site for incubator farmers to uh, train. And so uh, basically they go through a successful season as part of the, uh, of, of the farm crew, as a farm hand. And once they have uh, proven they're, they're uh, gonna do the, the best they can out here, then uh, we'll give them a small piece of land for a season. And uh, based on their rotation, you know, what they wanna do, if they wanna do tomatoes, we'll put them somewhere, hopefully there was some broccoli or something like that uh, before that. So they're going successful. And then uh, they grow their crops out with all the materials that we use on site. So it has to be, you know, um, already approved for our organic program. And then they're going to keep really good records as part of the whole training experience. And when it, their crops come, they can sell them at the farmer's market or they can sell them right to the packing shed. And so we have a, a way they're for all, it's like a all of their crops to be basically out, you know, and they, yeah. they can take their crops where they like. But, you know, um, it's always available to buy it at the packing shed there. Um, and that's yeah. a program that we're still looking to develop a little bit more. Thank you guys so much for taking the time today to show me your farm and show me your operation and how you guys have been able to make a regenerative agriculture system work 
um, for you all and for your community. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Come back for peach season in May. Yes, I will. <laughs> I plan on it. <laughs>